If a meteorite impacted the Earth, creating an expanding iridescent bubble that caused the death of anyone who entered, what would you do? In this How To Be video, we'll follow the scientist, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the shimmer in Annihilation. If you think you have a better way, let me know in the comments. If you like these How To Be videos, consider liking and subscribing. If you have a movie you'd like me to cover, vote on my Reddit page. Did you know it's Raid's second anniversary? It's been two whole years since Raid launched onto the mobile gaming scene, and it's only gotten bigger and better. Raid started out as just a bunch of cool character art and an idea, and now it's the number one RPG in the US with over a million players battling every day. It has over 70 million downloads, over 2 billion live player battles, and over 10 billion PvE battles that have been completed. For its two year anniversary, the schedule is absolutely packed with amazing events. They've got six straight weeks of anniversary events and tournaments running from March 1st all the way through to the middle of April, all of them with insane prizes to win. They're even launching Watching their first ever clan vs clan tournament which gives players a chance to compete directly against another clan to see who comes out on top. And if that's not enough, they just released their first champions in the Shadowkin faction. All of them look awesome, but the Dark Magic Samurai Jinturo has to be my favorite. Raid is huge already, but their anniversary event makes it an even better time to join. It's free to play on both mobile and desktop, so there's no reason not to. If you want to get a big head start in Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan my QR code and you'll get your free epic champion Jotun, which you can use to tear down the Doom Tower, 100,000 silver, 50 gems, and 3 ancient shards which can summon more badass champions as soon as you get in game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Rewards will be available only for the next 30 days and only for new players. Let's get to it. We start out following Lena, a cellular biology professor and army veteran, being questioned after returning as the sole survivor of an expedition to an anomalous zone known as the Shimmer. The interrogator asks her how she survived on a few days worth of food rations when they recounted that she was inside the Shimmer for four months. Lena replies that she only thought she was inside for a few days. Given the alien and unknown nature of the Shimmer, it's possible there's a time dilation inside its border. However, Lena did say that all of her team members mysteriously died and vanished. I don't want to jump to conclusions here, but I don't think we can rule out that Natalie Portman whacked her teammates and ate them. We then rewind to a couple weeks before her expedition into the Shimmer. She's dealing with depression from losing her soldier husband who was missing in action for the past year after a covert op went sideways, as far as she was told. After 12 months of nothing, he shows up at home. Only it's not the type of reunion you see in YouTube videos where the soldier shows up, hugs his wife, gives their dog a belly rub, and they take their kids to go get ice cream. Kane looks like his sanity and soul got sucked out of his body. He's unable to recall what happened or how he got here. He also says something interesting. I saw you. I recognized you. Whatever happened to him, it must have triggered a massive disassociative disorder, with the added complication of throwing up blood. Lena dials 911 and en route to the hospital, they get hijacked by a bunch of unmarked black vans full of spec op soldiers. The next thing Lena knows is that she's waking up in a detention cell being questioned about her husband by a psychologist. She quickly realizes that she should probably get a lawyer before answering any more questions, which would normally be a good call, but it doesn't work very well when you're at a CIA black site and they just refuse. Knowing Lena's prodigious credentials in cellular biology and her intimate relationship with one of the soldiers sent into the Shimmer, they give her front row seats to the phenomenon and debrief her on what they know, which isn't much. We have many theories, few facts. It appeared three years ago after a meteorite impacted next to a lighthouse, and when the park warden went to check it out, he never returned. I get the appeal of wanting to check out an alien phenomenon, but maybe carelessly wandering into an alien bubble you know nothing about was a stupid idea. Since then, they've sent in drones, animals, and teams of people by air, land, and sea to investigate it, but nothing and no one that entered the Shimmer ever came back. That is, until Lena's husband did, albeit not unscathed. He's suffering from multiple organ failure, among many other things. Apparently, their examinations of Kane haven't revealed any new information, nor had they even detected him leaving the Shimmer. Unless he teleported, I have a hard time believing he just waltzed out without anyone noticing. As far as the SWAT team, I think they only came after Lena dialed 911 for Kane, which triggered alarms at the NSA. Dr. Ventress mentions that they've deployed their usual unoriginal cover-up narrative of a chemical spill to avoid rampant speculation and visitation by the 
masses, which seems to have worked because most of the world is still somehow unaware of the Shimmer's existence after three whole years. The cover-up is not going to last long with how rapidly the Shimmer is expanding, so they're on the clock to figure this thing out and stop it before they lose all control. That's why they're launching another expedition in a few days led by psychologist Dr. Ventress, followed by physicist Josie Raddick, geomorphologist Cassie Shepard, and paramedic Anya Thorensen. The mission statement is to enter, acquire data, and return. Why is a psychologist in charge of investigating and stopping this extraterrestrial phenomenon, dictating who goes into the Shimmer, and leading an expeditionary unit into the unknown which has claimed countless lives already? Shouldn't somebody with more relevant experience be leading this operation? Hell, I don't get why you'd bring a psychologist at all. There isn't any strong evidence to suggest that the Shimmer causes psychological disorders. Humans that went inside didn't come back crazy, they just didn't come back at all. I mean, came, came back crazy, but you get my point. You could say that people didn't come back because they went crazy for some reason, but it's doubtful that that's the issue because their insentient drones became compromised as well. Even if the Shimmer was making them homicidal and suicidal, she'd be affected too. It's not like she's going to be sitting down and having therapy lessons with them. It's interesting, our thing, isn't it? To be in someone's mind, to have complete control. It's like the thrill of being near the executioner's switch, knowing that at any moment, you could throw it. The geomorphologist, which is a person that studies the evolution of topography by physical, chemical, or biological processes, I kind of get. From their POV from outside the shimmer, the topography within looks unchanged or is indiscernibly different. So bringing someone in to study how the topography of earthly land masses changes, assuming that the land is changing. But maybe they have reason to believe that there's a terraforming type process going on, in which case this person could be valuable in gleaning insights as to how these changes are occurring. Occurring. As for the physicist, yeah, totally makes sense. Energy, matter, space, time, math, 100%. What I don't get is why they haven't sent a physicist in already in the three years they've known about the Shimmer. And if they already have, to no success, why send in more? The soldiers and teams they've sent in prior to this expedition would have had medical training, which obviously didn't help them. Still, I guess it couldn't hurt to bring a paramedic along. But these choices just feel odd and haphazard. I'm starting to get the feeling that after three years of failed attempts to study it from the outside and inside, they're getting hopeless and just hail marrying and anyone brave, dumb, curious, or desperate enough to volunteer. You want to come with us? I can't do anything for him here like Lena. Dr. Ventress accepts her request, and why wouldn't she? There's not too many scientists that are willing to step inside a black hole to investigate what's on the other side of the event horizon. Again, at this point, why not send in a cellular biologist? F*** it. They really just handed rifles and rations to a bunch of scientists, professors, and doctors, and then pointed them towards the alien bubble of death with no military escort. Yeah, I'd say the government has officially stopped caring. We don't know the full extent of the things they've already tried, only what was briefly mentioned by Dr. Ventress. Based on what we do know, could we have attacked the Shimmer problem at its onset better than a depressed psychologist? I think so. The meteorite that impacted the lighthouse was sizable enough that it should have been picked up by sensors or witnessed by humans, and then investigated by research teams. Luckily, like all these movies, it landed on a remote shoreline and not in a major city. Upon realizing that they most definitely are dealing with something not from this world and which defies all understanding, an immediate quarantine and cover-up should be implemented. It should go without saying that the Shimmer should be regarded as potentially extremely dangerous, especially considering that they already had a person go MIA inside it. As much data should be acquired from outside the bubble as possible. Even with the Shimmer border refracting and distorting the light, you can still see inside, and there doesn't appear to be any notable changes occurring. Satellites and drones should be able to obtain a decent level of fidelity and be able to see what's going on inside. All types of sensors should be employed and tested at the edges as well. The next stage would be sending in drones to run tests from within the Shimmer. Like Dr. Ventress, I would quickly find out that the signals would be distorted by the Shimmer's border, and thus controlling the drones via electromagnetic waves from the outside wouldn't be possible. That's not a huge problem. Electricity and machines still operate just fine within its borders. I've been checking my comms and nav equipment. They boot up fine, no problem with the electronics and the cameras working, but... Anything that sends a signal out of the Shimmer 
is down. You could code instructions into drones to fly a specific course and return to base, so the drone would not need to be controlled remotely. You could even rig up giant overhead camera systems like football stadiums have. There's only so much you could learn from video, and they will likely need to obtain physical samples, run experiments with mice, and set up more advanced equipment within the Shimmer. Luckily, most of this could be accomplished just inside the permeable border with minimal human exposure. As with most things, the answers usually lie in the origin. The bubble should still be small enough at the beginning that trekking in wouldn't be much of a journey. Still, you'd want to closely monitor anyone who passed through the border, as well as try to protect them as much as possible using biosuits, handheld sensors, attaching them to cables to pull them out, keeping them in eyesight, and having manual methods of communication that don't rely on electromagnetic waves. I think a more optimal and efficient method would be to either drive in via the shoreline or land a helicopter right next to the lighthouse. The helicopter should be functional, there just wouldn't be any communications with the outside. If for some reason this wasn't possible, you could potentially parachute a team into the lighthouse area, then use a Fulton surface-to-air recovery system to extract them quickly. This way would minimize their exposure time and get to the source immediately. We'll see how these strategies could impact how the story unfolds. For now, let's continue. Right after they pass through the Shimmer Wall, they immediately wake up at camp with no memory of anything they did after passing through the border. They figure they've been inside for a few days already based on the rations that have been used up. Perhaps passing through the Shimmer border altered their neurochemistry, which triggered a form of amnesia. This affliction would not have been a surprise if they did proper testing at the border with mice and closely monitored terminally ill patients before yellowing in a bunch of researchers into the alien Bermuda Triangle. Needless to say, not remembering remembering the last few days since you entered would be incredibly worrying and grounds to leave immediately. The team agrees and attempts to locate their position with their GPS equipment and compasses, as well as radio their situation to the forward operating base. None work. The shimmer must be disrupting the electromagnetic waves in the entire EM field. Again, it should have been painfully obvious that none of this would work without previous teams ghosted them, and if they had run literally any tests whatsoever. Even Dr. Ventress makes a smart smart-ass remark about how it was ridiculous to think their equipment would work. We weren't really expecting the comms equipment to work, were we? I mean, it's been three years of expeditions and three years of radio silence. Which, like, cool. Then why didn't you as team lead prepare any sort of redundancy or backup forms of communication? Oh, right. Because you're a f***ing psychologist. Things like Morse code communicated via sound or light to observers on the outside, colored flare guns, or even a damn homing pigeon could have been implemented. Flares could have also been used for location identification or to signal for an immediate exfiltration so they didn't have to hike for three days back to the border after they realized they had massive memory loss. It's also a bit ridiculous that there was no implementation of situation reports, say every 30 minutes or so, using these forms of manual communication. You'd want a constant relaying of inside data so if something happens to them, it doesn't just die with them. They currently have no idea where they are or what direction is north, so they use the sun and the time to orient themselves. Our hand at the sun. Split the difference between the hour hand and 12, south. Pretty smart. Once oriented, they decide to head south towards the lighthouse because that's where the shoreline is and they can easily walk alongside it to the border, which is exactly why they should have entered via the shoreline in the first place. But now that they're trying to get out, going south to the shoreline doesn't make much sense. The shoreline is much more likely to lead them into the heart of the shimmer where its effects are strongest. Going north towards their base and civilization seems like a better idea. Nonetheless, the team breaks camp and heads for shore. The next thing they come across is an abandoned cabin with strange flowers growing around it. I personally wouldn't have thought anything of it, but Lena's cellular biology background is throwing off red flags. To look at them, you wouldn't say that they're the same species. They're growing from the same branch structure. The shimmer appears to be causing some form of genetic mutation or enhanced cross-hybridization in the plant life, which Lena and Dr. Ventress both suggest could be caused by disease. It's possible that the meteorite could have harbored pathogens that infected the surrounding organic life, and the EM field distortion is being caused by an unknown element in the meteorite. It's also possible that it wasn't a meteorite at all. It could be an alien drone sent to Earth to terraform it for their species. Whatever caused these genetic mutations in the plants could also cause them in humans. It would explain everyone going missing and Kane throwing up blood. The team is likely already 
fucked if that's the case, but I wouldn't be snacking on plant berries or refilling my canteen in a stream. And on that point, I know these are unique looking flowers and not the corpse of a little green man, but wouldn't you want to be wearing some latex gloves at least? There's just a general lack of PPE that's probably going to get somebody killed. It doesn't seem like they brought any equipment along that they could use to examine and test their strange findings. They're basically guinea pigs blindly stumbling in the direction of the lighthouse trying to guess what's going on by feel. I'm sure this will work out for them just fine. Anya wants to use the boat, which I think could be a good idea to take the load off their legs since they've been hiking for a week now. Get back. On second thought, negative on the float trip through mutated hyper-aggressive alligator infested waters. I know Josie got jumped out of nowhere and they couldn't have predicted getting hunted by super gators, but this is the southeastern area of the US, so they should have at least been briefed and trained on gators being a possible threat. All the science geeks running around like chickens with their heads cut off is exactly why having a military escort would have been a good idea. I will give Lena some big credit for handling that AR-15 like an absolute boss and saving everyone's asses though. While Lena was sending hot lead down the red spotted albino gator's throat, she noticed something odd about its teeth. So they pull its mouth back open and crazy as it may sound, this gator has concentric rows of shark teeth in it. The hybrid flowers were strange. Alligators with shark teeth? That's on another level completely. How could an alligator be sharing genetic traits of a shark? It's impossible that they made it due to the vast genetic differences between the two species. And, uh, anatomical differences. This would imply that the mutations that they are observing could be caused by a form of horizontal gene transfer called transduction. Basically, an alien virus. Here's the problem with this theory. They aren't anywhere close to an ocean, and alligators typically don't travel very far, so how would this gator have come into contact with a virus that infected a shark? Something else is going on. Somehow they're unfazed by the mutated reptiles and hop into some canoes to navigate the swamps until they reach Fort Amaya, the old military headquarters that was used until the shimmer swallowed it. The sides of the concrete bunkers have, as Lena points out, colorful malignant tumors growing on them. There's not much else to do but take samples and keep heading for the exfil location. With sundown rapidly approaching and not wanting to be out in the open with the mutant wildlife, they decide to set up camp in the base. When they enter the mess hall, they find the abandoned gear of the soldiers they previously sent in. A bad sign, but at least there's no bodies. Or wait, is it worse that there's no bodies? Guess we'll find out soon enough. Lena spots a guard roster with Kane's name on it, among other names that were suspiciously crossed out. She says that if the soldiers were guarding the perimeter, they should too. Honestly, you probably should have been doing that from the start. Though I doubt it will help you much if multiple special forces teams got annihilated. But hey, maybe your psychologist team lead will do a better job of watching your six while you sleep behind alien lines. They also find a package containing a video labeled for those that follow. I'm getting Halo Flood vibes here. Okay, that's not normal or explainable in any way. It would have been nice if the soldiers wrote down a detailed report of what was going on instead of just leaving a cryptic video. Dr. Ventress notices the area where the video was taken and they find the soldier with the snake intestines. Whatever was happening to him progressed until he turned into a psychonaut's wet dream. Lena takes some samples of Captain Keys while Josie decides to stick her bare hand in the murky water to pick up the bloody knife that was used to cut open the infected soldier with the snake intestines. Do you want snake intestines? Because that's how you get snake intestines. Good call setting up in the guard tower for the night. I wouldn't want to be at ground level with the shark gators, man bear pigs, spider snakes, panthers with fire ant mandibles, or whatever other monstrosities the shimmer's creating. Lena did bring a microscope after all. How is she just now getting around to examining the samples? This is literally the first time anyone has broken out a single piece of equipment on their science expedition. So far it's been more like a bunch of middle schoolers on a field trip trying to catch butterflies. 
Under the microscope, each sample's cell division is producing a shimmering child variant. I'd say she should check her own blood sample too, but I think she knows they're already affected. The shimmering child cells should have been observable by testing mice and collecting plant life samples at the border. Shame they had to figure it out like this. For some reason, Dr. Ventress is at ground level in a guard post instead of guarding from the tower, which is a way better vantage point, much safer and close enough to her team that she could get help if something attacked. They are in a national park full of dangerous animals and insects that are undergoing crazy mutations. There could be anything out there. I'd also have brought that M249 saw up to the guard tower for additional firepower. You can never have too much firepower, especially in situations like this. What was that? Don't know. Sounds like some hungry wildlife caught a whiff of fresh meat. Cassie, Anya, and Josie all hear it, wake up, and leave the safety of their guard tower to wander into the dark tall grass where they heard the roaring beast. Lena is the only one who brought NVGs and their shitty Gen 2 ones. Could the government not spare some thermal goggles or mounted flashlights for the most important mission humans have ever embarked on? Then again, this whole operation has been led by a psychologist who's done nothing but the bare minimum. I hate to say it, but Cassie's 100% dead. No sense in running into the forest and getting killed too. The next morning, Dr. Ventress plans to continue towards the lighthouse with or without them. Anya and Josie both want a GTFO immediately with the evidence they have, but know they need Lena's help since she's the only one capable of defending them. Lena agrees that they should go back, but insists that going to the shoreline is the best route out of the Shimmer, citing that it took them six days to get here when the shoreline is only two days away. It's a tough call. The lighthouse is the epicenter, so the mutations would be worse going towards it. But once they got to the shore, it would be one long walk on the beach and they'd be free. If they backtracked, it would probably take longer and they'd be traversing marshlands full of dangerous wildlife. The only benefit is that they'd be getting further from the source, which might not even matter at this point. Lena has to know that their cells are dividing into shimmer cells too, so their best shot at surviving is going to the source to try to find the off button. This isn't some bullshit tactic to get us to the lighthouse, is it? You should have a map that you could use to verify all of this super easily. Must be the PTSD or shimmer-induced schizophrenia that's making her so paranoid. Either way, I'd unload a rifle when she wasn't looking. Anya and Josie both reluctantly agree to head towards the lighthouse with Lena and Ventress. On their way, they come across Cassie's bloody boot, and Lena splits up from the group to confirm that Cassie was killed. Normally, I'd say splitting up is a bad idea, but with these paranoid, untrained, panicky idiots, it's probably best they aren't behind you with their finger on the trigger. This must have been what Lena was mentioning about duplicate forms. The way they moved is more than mutation. It's almost like a melding of consciousness or something. Lena taking her rucksack off before heading into the suspicious area where she expected a potential conflict is a nice touch and shows her military training. Yeah, Shepard didn't make it. They are currently in the Bear Things territory. It could still be out here, so maybe you slack-jawed dolts should stay alert and have your guns on low ready until you're out of the danger zone. Things continue to get stranger. In one of the clearings, there's plants in the shape of humans. Upon examination, Josie supposed is that if you sequence the genome of these plant person things, you would find semblances of the human hox gene, which is the gene that determines the layout of our body, how humans grow to be humans. Josie has a theory on why this may be. Signals aren't gone. They're scrambled. The shimmer is a prism, but it refracts everything. All DNA. Surely you could have found that out with testing done at the border like I mentioned earlier. It took you a week of exposure wandering around an alien dreamscape to come to that conclusion? If what you're saying is true, that we don't know because apparently the scientific method now means making bold assumptions without any rigor or testing, then you are all basically dead. You'll either end up as wall art, bear shit, or have mutated so much so fast that yourself will cease to exist. At their next camp, Anya notices her hand changing shape. It appears as though going towards the lighthouse was a bad idea. Whoops. Lena confirms their suspicions when she puts her own blood under the microscope. When each of their human cells divide, they produce a shimmer cell much like the other samples. Hey, on the bright side, maybe they'll gain some superhero powers out of this. I'm not too optimistic though. What's that line from the Kingsman? This ain't that kind of movie, bro. 
Yeah, this ain't that kind of movie. Lena's been having flashbacks of her having an affair while her husband was deployed. She now realizes that Kane had found out, and that's why he took on more dangerous missions like this one. She's starting to draw connections between the self-destructive behavior present in her, in her husband, and all our team members, and the genes of the cells that she studies professionally, and in the entropic conditions of the Shimmer. It's hard to say what this means or how it could help. It's almost like they're fighting a force of nature. Anya finally snaps under the expedited entropy present in the Shimmer and ties up all of her teammates. There were two theories about what happened to the previous teams. That something killed them or they all went crazy and killed each other. Since Anya never saw the bear or Cassie's body, she thinks that they're all lying and conspiring against her. The Shimmer induced amnesia must still be affecting them because she most definitely heard the bear roar and Cassie screaming for her life. Just before she carves open their stomachs to see if their insides are moving, she hears what sounds like Cassie calling for help. <laughs> Lena knows that Cassie's dead, and this is yet another distorted form of danger, but Anya's skepticism of Cassie's death compels her to run outside and check it out. <laughs> I don't think that was Cassie. Yeah, that's definitely not Cassie. Lena tells everyone not to react, which is a bit easier said than done when face to face with this. Actually, I thought with black bears you're supposed to get as big and loud as possible and that you're not supposed to play dead with them. This is the shimmer though, so who knows what this thing actually is. <laughs> That explains why it sounded like Cassie screaming outside. Thinking back, Cassie's body did have her vocal cords gnawed out. Her DNA must have transferred into the bear's throat and mutated its vocal structures to replicate hers. Staying chill seems to be working until Anya rolls in like a lead farmer. She shoots way too high and misses all of her shots and then gets her jaw ripped clean off. Josie gets free, grabs a rifle, and dumps a mag into the bear's face before Lena gets mutilated. The next morning, Dr. Ventress heads off to the lighthouse by herself to finish the job before she and the rest of the crew becomes compromised too. With Josie currently turning into a plant, I'd say that's a good call. We never see Josie's final form, but it's implied that she turned into a more grotesque form of the Hawks gene plants. Lena's only real option is to continue to the lighthouse, meet up with Dr. Ventress, find the source, and destroy it if possible. She makes it to the shoreline where there's glass trees forming out of the beach sand. Everything they encountered up until now was caused by genetic mutations of living matter. So how is sand turning into glass and actively forming tree-like structures? There's no living cells, no energy source, no inherent capacity for movement or genetic mutation. This is evidence that there's more to the shimmer than the emittance of a form of radiation that's refracting and transferring DNA between living organisms. In front of the lighthouse, there's skeletons laid out in a ceremonious fashion, which Lena doesn't seem to pay much attention to. One of the soldiers must have lost it and killed their teammates before turning themselves into the bomb shadow scene inside. Like all horrific tragedies and disasters, I'm just glad we got it on camera. Lena does what any of us would do and hits play. Kane nuking himself with a phosphorus grenade on camera is fucked up, but then we find out that the cameraman is another Kane. Could it be a duplicate form like the deer she saw earlier? And if so, which one was actually her husband? I have a feeling I'm gonna be left with a lot more questions. Lena then hears Dr. Ventress down inside the mysterious meteorite hole and crawls in after her. She finds, well, I don't know if it's actually Dr. Ventress anymore. The Ventress thing says that it's inside them that it's not like them and that it will grow until it encompasses everything. It will fragment their bodies and minds into their smallest parts until not one part remains. Annihilation. In physics, annihilation is a reaction in which a particle and its antiparticle collide, resulting in the particles turning into energy. The meteorite or UFO, whatever it is, could be made of antimatter or emitting antiparticles in some way. I don't know enough about particle physics to speculate any further than this and neither does this story's creator. Ventress then proceeds proceeds to puke technicolor rainbows until her body glows incandescent and evaporates into a seemingly sentient mini nebula that seduces Lena with its fractal deadlights. I still got nothing here guys. A drop of Lena's blood gets gravity welled into it and using her DNA it creates an iridescent metallic humanoid replica of her. Naturally Lena gets freaked the fuck 
Gowden runs out of the cave, but the humanoid teleported ahead of her. This confirms that the Shimmer is warping space and time in some way too. Her humanoid is mirroring, imitating, almost learning from her. It doesn't seem to want to hurt her, but Lena's not taking any chances. By detonating the bomb in its hands and seeing the flames melt it back into its metallic form, she realized that the original Kane was the one that died. For some uninterpretable reason, the humanoid harnesses the flames and ignites the source of the shimmer, burning and collapsing all of its constructs to the ground. I don't even think Lena knew what she was doing. Blowing up her half-hostile doppelganger was just the only thing that made sense. This method of destroying the shimmer was not something you could calculate, predict, or strategize around. Kane and Ventress both entered the cave and were cloned or annihilated without successfully destroying the Shimmer. It was purely serendipitous that Lena's effort succeeded. If Lena's mission had failed, I'd probably have tried nuking the lighthouse as a last ditch, but besides that, I don't know what could have been done. The original Lena, if you can call her that, survives and makes it back to the base where she's questioned about what happened. It wasn't destroying. It was changing everything. It was making something new. No real answers or explanations are provided. Everything that had occurred just raised more questions. How Lena got the Euroboros tattoo, which both Anya and Snake Intestines Bro had. How Kane magically healed once the Shimmer collapsed. Why the humanoid destroyed the Shimmer. How Lena survived for four months without food, or if there was a time dilation. If the Shimmer was truly gone, and on and on. The movie ends with Lena and Kane's humanoid embracing each other with a Shimmer in both their eyes. The scientists should have discovered their Shimmer cells when they took their blood samples. Not sure how that would help though. It's possible they could reverse science the Shimmer cells or at minimum prevent Kane and Lena from going back into the world and reproducing Shimmer children. So how could things have gone down differently? With more comprehensive and thorough testing done as well as inserting teams directly at the source instead of having humans hike 40 miles from the border to the lighthouse, their exposure would have been mitigated and chances of survival and success improved significantly. However, the Shimmer relied on too much serendipity to occur to say that we could have predictably beaten it. So I'd say that the Shimmer was unbeaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, if you see a meteorite impact the Earth and a massive shimmering bubble appears around it, don't wander into it to check it out yourself.